justice for Darren Rainey. He died after being locked in a prison shower. We'll talk to the deputy state attorney. The relationship goes beyond um, any personalities at any given time. State of relations. Israel's former ambassador is here with us with a look at U.S.-Israeli issues in the time of Trump. This is going to ignite a bigger fire within us. Close call, two Miami-Dade cops are wounded in a violent ambush. How do you get guns away from gang members? We'll take that to the roundtable. Good morning. So great to have you with us. As always, we begin today with the case of the mentally ill prison inmate who died in a hot shower. A criminal case closed after five years with no one held criminally accountable. Darren Rainey was an inmate at Dade Correctional Institution, a state prison down near Homestead. On the night of June 23, 2012, Rainey was found dead on the shower floor. The Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office decided nearly five years later that Rainey's death was accidental and that the corrections officers who put him in that shower meant him no harm and acted without malice. But new information has called into question some of the conclusions in that closeout memo and cast doubt on the decision not to file criminal charges. We'll talk all about all of that with Don Horn, who is the chief assistant state attorney in Miami-Dade, a veteran of that office. He oversees administrative matters for more than 300 prosecutors and the Miami-Dade County Grand Jury. And Julie Brown is a reporter for the Miami Herald who has done in-depth reporting on the case of Darren Rainey and has also also exposed some troubling issues and abuses in the Florida prison system. Good morning. Thank Good morning. you so Good much morning. for being with Good us morning. this morning. Well, Julie, Don Horn, great to have you here. Mr. Horn, the closeout memo, and here it is, exhaustive, 101 pages of information, says that Darren Rainey's death was accidental, but he was put in a hot shower for nearly two hours. How was that accidental? Why was that, that not a criminal act? Uh, I think a couple of issues first. Uh, we evaluate cases based on evidence. We make charging decisions based on evidence. And your initial premise is that he was put in a hot shower. We don't have any evidence of whether he was put in a hot shower or not. We know that the water was warm because there was humidity in the shower. We have no evidence of what the temperature of the shower was. However, we know that the shower was not hot enough to burn him anywhere on his body. The characterization of accidental is not a conclusion from our office. That's a designation determination by the medical examiner's office. Right, the Dade County Medical Examiner right. is the one. But the, the state attorney's office, you, Kathy Rundle, uh, Kathleen Hogue, the other people who worked on this, yes. came, accepted her conclusion. Correct. Now, the accidental is only a designation by the medical examiner's office because it's either going to be a homicide, suicide, accidental, natural. I think I'm, I'm, I'm missing one. So in terms of the options, the evidence is this was not a homicide, any manner of homicide. Was it culpable negligence? We determined there was no culp culpable negligence. And again, I think you have to start from the beginning. Yes, it's clear that Mr. Rainey was suffering uh, from mental illness, and part of that manifested itself in the fact that he defecated on himself and smeared feces all over his body and right. over his cell. And that's the reason he was placed in the cell. Uh, not as any punishment, he was put in the cell to kind of clean himself up. Uh, he was taking medication that created some mm. side effects that, of course, the correctional officers would not have known. So in terms of charging them... They didn't them, know he was taking the Solidol, this very powerful antipsychotic drug? They're correctional officers. They're not the folks, the nurses who are giving medication. They would not have privy to his medical history. That would be a violation of HIPAA. HIPAA. Was. Absolutely. Uh, and so this combination of things, one of the medications he was taking, one of the complications is it made it more difficult for his body to regulate his internal temperature. And so being in a warm shower would have caused a problem for him, even in a shower as large as this shower was. You know, um, we, as we discuss this, we have the photographs from the closeout memo. There yes. are videos involved. Julie, yes. I, I want to bring you into this conversation. It seems like the linchpin of the closeout memo is this autopsy, Dr. Emma Lou, Miami-Dade medical examiner. And the autopsy really has nothing to indicate that Darren Rainey was, and, and people have been using the words boiled to death, which is just horrific to even listen to, but there is not one thing in that autopsy that corroborates that in a scientific manner. So, so what do you make of that? Well, we're hoping that maybe the a medical examiner will allow uh, one of, we, we have a 
private consultant that we're using. Uh, we're hoping that she's going to let us look at the evidence that she, she the reasons why she came to those conclusions, number one. Number two, I, I'd just like to bring up my understanding that it, even in the, the case of an accidental death, for example, if you have a child who's left in a bath um, by a parent who, I don't know, maybe the parent was on drugs or gambling or doing something else, and that child ends up dead. Now, there's no question the parent didn't intend for that child to die, and it's an accident. And this happens in Florida, you know, specifically yes. with children being left in cars a lot. And I just question whether uh, the same conclusion would have been reached had it been a child. And, and in essence, uh, Darren Rainey had, was like a child. He was being taken care of. He had mental, mental issues. Uh, and I just question whether this uh, idea of culpable negligence was really thoroughly examined. Can, can I just follow up on the consultant that you're using? Is that the Herald has hired a consultant? Where you, who, we're is the, use who is the consultant and why would this consultant have any more expertise than the it's investigators It's just a for forensic pathologist that we're going to use to just it, go over it and like take a, a look at second it. Second opinion? Exactly. Kind of and that brings another question. This was a pretty high profile case. It languished for two years before the state attorney and the police even started scrutinizing it. Well, it so, languished until you began reporting it, honestly. I mean, you were groundbreaking in your reporting. Then it was reopened and it got a lot of attention. Don Horn, uh, a Captain Darlene Watson, who was the health and safety officer at this time at DCI, went into the the shower existed, you know, there and then, but the controls were in an adjoining janitor's closet. Yes. Now, I grant you, it was two days after this incident, right. but she went in there with a meat thermometer yes. and she measured the water temperature. She said it hurt her hand to even be splashed by the water, but it, it registered at 160 degrees. Now, that's 40 degrees hotter than generally is allowed in any institution. Yes, and that sounds horrific, but it has no relevance to this case. And one, I'm assuming she went in there and just turned the hot water on. This is a tap that has hot water, cold water. Right. We don't know what the settings were when Mr. Rainey was in the shower. Yeah. We know the water could not have been 106 degrees well, what, conclusively. Excuse me. What, mm -hmm. what the, the officers, the correctional officers that night who put him in the shower yes, sir. were Roland Clark and Cornelius Thompson. Yes, sir. What did they tell you about putting him in the shower and the water temperature. They uh, took him upstairs, and we've got a portion of this on video. He's got on the Murphy uh, garment, he's cuffed. Uh, he says, they take him upstairs, turns the water on. The guard says he steps into the shower to test the water temperature. All you've got is water coming out of a hose, mm -hmm. pretty much out of the side of a wall. Right. And then he puts Granny in, takes the cuffs off, and tries to coax him into showering himself. But there's nothing indicating that someone went in there, turned the hot water on only at 106 degrees or whatever temperature is, uh, and left him there. But we know the water could not have been that hot because there are no burns anywhere hmm. on his body. Hmm. So what you're doing right now here is just raising questions and raising doubt, and that's really all you would need to do to kill a case. We, we have to have evidence to be able to go for it with a case and then we have Beyond to have a reasonable and doubt we have to have sufficient evidence. evidence that if it goes to trial we're going to be able to prove that beyond a reasonable doubt yeah. when so I, 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 I want I Julie to, to I don't think it. that it's necessary don't, don't get me wrong this isn't a slam dunk kind of case this is a tough case I, I don't disagree with that but when you have a case like this my view is we have a justice system for a reason we have juries for a reason do the best thorough investigation that you could do, and then let a jury decide. Why take the decision away from a jury when it is a case such as this one where uh, there was, uh, you know, there were seven inmates that heard him screaming. Seven inmates who there. testified that they heard him screaming. There was a corrections officer. And by the way, a lot of this isn't in your closeout memo. There were correction. There was a corrections officer that said that he knows that they were using that shower as a torture device that other inmates said, five other inmates testified. They weren't all mentally ill in inmates, by the way. They testified that they also had been put into that shower. Although there was, there was a nurse there who had never reported any kind of injuries in the shower prior to this, well, which, 
which kind of refutes what well, was in this is what happened, and, the, and all the inmates Oops. told the detectives this. We never reported that we were put in the shower because we were threatened that if we told anybody, they would put us in the shower again. And none of that information came out in any other statements that were taken by the detectives. And most of the inmates, they, they tracked down every person who was inside that unit, both units, that night and spoke with them. Most of the inmates said, oh yes, I love taking a shower in that shower because you could control them. The showers, the normal showers were usually cold. They were timed, you press a button, the shower came on and when the time was up, it cut off and the water was usually cold. Most of the inmates said, I prefer to take a shower there and some of the guards even let us set the temperature right. ourselves. So that's totally contrary to, again, mm -hmm. some of the allegations that were All there. Right. Well, there are a lot of contradictions, but Absolutely. we want to continue talking about the Darren Rainey case, so stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We are in the middle of a discussion about the Darren Rainey case with Don Horn from the state attorney's office, Julie Brown, reporter for the Miami Herald, a difficult case um, in which there is video of the inside of this prison. The closeout memo, Don, suggests that the video shows and documents a timeline that is completely different from the inmates account that and especially Hempstead, inmate Correct. Harold Hempstead, who is really the main witness here, that his account and the video timeline just don't match. They don't. Was, was that a linchpin for this for you? That was one of them and that was significant because it became apparent to us as we went through the investigation, started reading the documents, uh, that he was the person who provided the most information, not just about the rainy incident, but the allegations regarding other abuses that had gone on in the prison, uh, and that he'd spoken to other inmates and tried to get them to contact the media to write letters and do those kinds of things. He became crucial, cru crucial because as we looked at the video, there's a video camera right out of his cell, and based on his testimony at the time he Is was, that what we were looking at, this video that uh, we were just looking at? Yes. Okay, I'm yes. oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, he is saying that things are happening at a certain time he knows because he looks at his watch. Well, at the time he's looking at his watch and at the time he's describing these things happening, he can't see them. How do we know? Because he's got his window of his cell covered up from the inside by newspapers. And do we so, see that in the video? Oh, uh, th that's not in this specific uh, video here, but as it plays out over a period of time, yeah. we can see he removes the video and at some point goes back on the bed. Yeah. It, so Julia, what about I, the other witnesses, though? There were other witnesses that said that they saw the same thing. And, and the, also, I'd like to just point out one thing. I, I'm curious why you focus so much on Harold Hempstead's timeline, and yet the police officers, or corrections officers, rather, who were involved in it, they were never asked the timeline. Why, why weren't they asked the time? Um, I don't know what you mean by ask a timeline. Like, what time did you check on Darren Rainey? We've, what time did you put them in there? We've got the log that was kept at the security desk that indicates when the correctional officers are making their rounds. And the video itself shows them the various officers going through at different times. So that corroborates that testimony. The time log, time log matches up with the video evidence. There were a couple of crucial pieces of evidence for me that for me kind of said this was not an abusive situation. One of them is the soap. If you're putting him in there to punish him, why do you go and get him soap? It doesn't make any sense. Although well, they he did was not give him with soap. To I understand that. But, but again, if the focus is I'm putting him here to punish him, what the correctional officer says, Rainey said, once he kept trying to get him to coast him to wash the feces off, okay, I'll do it, go get me some soap. And we've got video corroboration. So we look for corroboration and consistency. We can see the uh, officer going from the second floor down to the first floor. He goes to Hempstead's cell. Hempstead corroborates the fact that the correctional officer gets the soap and he takes the soap upstairs. So if he's getting him soap, this looks like somebody who's trying to help this person instead of Well, hurting. I don't think that they wanted to put him back in the cell with feces all over him. I mean, regardless of whether he got the soap or not, it wouldn't have been a good idea for them to, to, to leave him in there for two hours. It just it's, makes no sense at all that they left him in there for that amount of time. They, can I ask you a question about Hempstead, Harold Hempstead? You went to what prison? He's, he's in a, a Tennessee prison now, but right. he was uh, upstate Florida when you went to visit him to do this interview with him. So you interviewed him firsthand. Right, right. What, what, in your opinion, 
in your analysis, what is his agenda? Why would he speak so freely to a reporter? Well, that's another point of this um, particular investigation. Um, all the inmates that they interviewed who were still at Dade Correctional wouldn't give any statements. They wouldn't talk because they were in the very prison where they felt that they were being punished and they were afraid. Without exception, almost every inmate that we interviewed or that the police interviewed who were someplace else, upstate, released in Martin Correctional, Swanee Correctional, all those inmates spoke freely about what happened in there. So right there you have a problem. Hempstead spoke more freely, obviously he would, when he was farthest away from the prison where this happened. He felt like he was, to some yeah. degree, a little but bit... Yeah, let's, just but, point but, but, let's just point, if I may, let's point out uh, Harold Hempstead, who says he's had a religious conversion in prison, right. is in prison for 161 right. years, I believe, because he is a serial burglar. He's no choir boy. But I've got to say, the videotaped interview you posted on the Miami Herald website of your interview with Hempstead, uh, frankly, he strikes me as telling a credible story. And, and, and one might think that, but let me give you another side of sure, this, because please. one of the things that he says is, oh yes, Rainey was screaming, and then he stopped screaming, and then I heard a, a thud, sounded like someone fell. And I knew something was wrong. And so I went up to my cell window, and I'm waving, and I'm waving, and I'm trying to get the attention of the guards. We've got the video camera right outside of his window. Nothing like that ever happens. Did you confront him with that discrepancy? We didn't know. All the statements were taken by right, the detectives, and I don't know whether they had the video yeah. at the time they were taking these statements, and I don't know... But, but that's what he said, and it is totally refuted. So when we're looking for consistency and corroboration, we don't get it with Hempstead. So if we're going to go for it on a case... But there were other inmates. Oh, there were, but nobody... Uh, there was another orderly, Mark Joyner, who gave a very credible statement that echoed almost everything that, that, uh, that Harold said. Uh, so, so it's, much emphasis in that report, eight pages as a matter of fact, is dedicated to discrediting Harold Hempstead, yet you don't address all the other uh, statements that were made by other inmates who said the same thing essentially that he said. But if the if the statements are Mr. Rainey got burnt in the shower, that's a non-starter because we know Why? factually They're that not experts. did not happen. These inmates aren't experts; they wouldn't that. have known but, that. But the whole but you said we all we all bring uh, charges and 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 justice was not done. We need to leave it to a jury. No, 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 no. We don't do that. We as prosecutors serve as individual jurors because we can't bring a case that we don't have sufficient evidence for. You say, well, just leave it up to the jury. Uh, I did an executive assignment uh, back in 1989 for a man who was prosecuted, accused of poisoning his seven kids. His name was James Joseph Richardson. The state in Arcadia, Florida, did not have sufficient evidence to prosecute him. They prosecuted him and led it up to the jury. The jury convicted him, gave him the death penalty, and but for Supreme Court case, Furman versus Georgia, that overturned all the death penalties, he would have been executed in Florida's electric chair for something he didn't do, and I'm the person who got him out of prison as a prosecutor. So we, justice does not dictate just filing cases when there's a I horrible agree. thing. We can't file against people who we don't have evidence. Real yeah, quickly before done, we go, yeah, uh, we, I just, we talked about in, yeah. the, in the commercial break, and just for the record, why, yes. why was the decision to not take this to a grand jury? One of the things that we, we always are facing, not just in this kind of case, and you know, this is in the same police shooting close out memo format. So if you've got mm -hmm. police shootings, same format. We don't take them, we don't take this, because anything that goes on in that grand jury room, and I'm the counsel for the grand jury, is done in secret. Those transcripts will not be released, uh, so mm -hmm. the public would have no idea about what got done. You want a this was yes, there was there, it's transparency. Absolutely, this is not a grand jury report. I, I draft the grand jury reports. No, we, this we, was a specific we, focus. We know what it is. Yes. I would also point out, I'm not a lawyer, obviously, but uh, the state attorney can file direct information. Absolutely, you know, you don't have to go to a grand jury absolutely. to charge somebody if we've got evidence. And, Correct. But you, you say you don't. All right, Julie Brown, great to have you come in. Look forward. Thank I you know so you were not finished. With this story, Don Brown, uh, Don Horn, <laughs> I know a Don Brown. <laughs> Don Horn, I know you as well. Thank you for coming in. Really Thank you for having us. A new relationship with Israel was one of President Trump's campaign promises. Is he delivering? That is one of the questions we ask Israel's former ambassador when he joins us right here next. On a campaign trail, then-candidate Donald Trump promised to take U.S.-Israeli relations in a new direction, a better direction. So, has he? 
And one of the people with insights is Israel's former ambassador to the United States. He was in South Florida this week speaking at Nova Southeastern University in Davie. And we are grateful that he is joining us this morning. Danielle Ayalon served as Israel's ambassador to the U.S. from 2002 to 2006, also served in the Knesset, Israel's parliament, and also has been his country's deputy foreign minister. Ambassador Ayalon, so great to Good have morning. you come in. My pleasure. Good to be with you. Well, let's begin with a really tough question, uh, and that is, is a two-state solution still possible for Israel and the Palestinians? Well... It is all matter on the timing, and it matters on the Palestinians' attitude. Um, um, if you recall, Prime Minister Netanyahu did not walk away from the two-state solution, and he is committed to that. The problem is that the Palestinians are not doing any attempts to even move forward in terms of uh, lowering their terror level, finishing the incitement, uh, not financing terrorists, glorifying the terrorists, uh, let alone they, they still do not recognize our self-determination right. And this the is right something... The right of Israel to the, exist. Exactly. And, uh, you know, we are a, a Jewish uh, nation by our DNA, by self-determination, by being indigenous over there, and they do not accept it, unfortunately. And this is really a major barrier towards moving forward. You know, President uh, Trump, one of his first meetings with the foreign heads of state was Prime Minister Netanyahu. And I, I remember, speaking of the two-state solution, I remember in this press conference that we're looking at right now, right after the president said, one-state solution, two-state solutions, I'm open to whatever <laughs> Israel wants, which is not really what we're used to hearing from President Trump. He has decisions. He says, I can do this. Describe how things have changed in the last two and a half months of the Trump presidency. Is he delivering on the promise to take this relationship in a new direction? Well, Glenna, one thing is constant, and it is irrespective, irrespective of who sits at the White House at any given time or the Prime Minister's office. Because of the very vital national interests of both our countries, Israel and the United States, the uh, relationship, the defense relations, the strategic, economic, goes on whoever sits, you know, no matter who sits in the, in the White House. Also, being sister democracies, like-minded countries, uh, based on the same values, nothing really has changed. So there is no new direction. However, there is some kind of perception. Sometimes chemistry is also very important between the leaders. Unfortunately, the last eight years, we did not have the best of chemistry. This is why I believe this two gentlemen now, Trump and Netanyahu, trying to start on the right foot with uh, actually uh, founding their relationship on trust, credibility, mutual respect. And in that sense, we see that um, there may be a real attempt to try to bring the Palestinians back to the negotiating table. What I understand that uh, Trump is really determined to strike a deal. For him, as he said in the campaign, would be the mother of all deals if he can yeah. bring the Palestinians and the and Israelis mm -hmm. together. Right. We'll have to wait and see. Well, one of the issues that is going to determine the nature of the relationship is Israel expanding settlements on the West Bank and in East Jerusalem. I mean, there are 600,000 Israelis who live currently in East Jerusalem and the settlements. And this week, the, the, the Netanyahu government said, we are going to expand a settlement. And then, after apparently the White House objected, uh, the government of Israel, of Mr. Netanyahu, pulled back and said, we will build within the existing settlements. Now, is, is that the kind of relation? Does that show positive uh, vibes between the two uh, governments? I believe so. See, we have to remember, Michael, that uh, Jewish communities in the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, were there from time immemorial. Uh, the truth of the matter is that both the, 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 the Arabs, after 48, and even before, they massacred the Jews in Hebron. There was a prospering community in Gush Etzion, in Jerusalem. So actually what we're doing is uh, just um, setting the record right, correcting a wrong by letting these people come back to their places. And right. there is no sense to um, bar Jews from living anywhere in the world. You know, just think, you would say, Jews cannot live or build communities here in Miami. It would not go. So this is not the crux of the matter. The crux of the matter is to bring the Palestinians without preconditions. And unfortunately, in the last eight years, when there was a perception that there is a daylight between Israel and the United States, mm -hmm. the Palestinians thought that the U.S. will deliver Israel to them. That means they wouldn't have to make any concessions. And this is why the process was stuck. I hope now 
with the understanding and the experience that we have, maybe the Trump administration will try a different approach. And so far, I think they're very busy trying to get the two parties together. Ambassador, one of President Trump's promises was to move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Well, frame for people who are not really into the issues, mm -hmm. why is that so important? And, and do you think that's going to happen? Well, it's important because Jerusalem is the capital. Internal capital of Israel has always been the capital of the Jewish people. Uh, never any other party or never other nation had it, it, it as its capital. You know, throughout the last two year, thousand years, nations and empires came and went. Nobody made it its capital. Uh, so it's only natural, and it will be very symbolic and very, uh, very important. This is our capital. So that will be correcting another wrong. Whether he will do it or not, I think he will probably wait to see. How will the Palestinians uh, behave? If they will be ready for real compromises and concessions and really change their attitude, the culture, there is a culture of hate, unfortunately, there, where they teach their children to demand not only what they claim, Gaza and Judea and Samaria, but also the Galilee, the Negev, everywhere that, that we and, live. And the right if, of return. And of course, uh, which is, I think it's euphemism, there's no right and no return. I, we don't have time to explain it, but I'll be happy to come back. But in any case, um, I think that Trump will wait and see. And he may hold this as a leverage against the Palestinians. Uh, if they do not come to the negotiating table, then he has nothing to lose, and he will correct this wrong. If not, uh, in any case, I believe he will do it in a gradual diplomatic way and not just in an instant. Boy, there is so much more to talk about. <laughs> you are going to be delivering the commencement address at Nova Southeastern University in August. Can we already invite you during that visit <laughs> to come back and talk uh, with us more? Absolutely. I can tell you NSU is a very dynamic, great institution, a great university, and I'm very happy also to bring uh, NSU to Israel because there is a lot of research compatibility between the best research institutes in Israel yeah. and, uh, and NSU in terms of uh, marine biology, STEM research, cancer research, right. nano, the students Everything. had some fairly provocative questions for you. Oh, but I enjoyed it. I, you know, great students <coughs> yeah. from 160 different countries, so it's very, very nice uh, well, body of students we're, here. We're glad you've got the connection with South Florida, and we invite yes. you back. Thank so you. thank you very much, thank Ambassador. You, Ambassador. Thank you. Up next. The Roundtable. The Roundtable. Stay with us. <laughs> It is that time once again for a closer, more analytical look at the week's top news stories with our powerhouse roundtable. And boy, we've got a great one for you today. Mark Caputo is correspondent for Politico and writes the daily Politico Florida playbook. Jessica Fernandez is the president of Miami Young Republicans, and she was a delegate to last summer's GOP convention. Kind of a claim to fame there. Marlon Hill is a Miami attorney with the Hamilton B Miller and Bertha Sill firm and past president of the Caribbean Bar Association and roundtable regulars all. Thanks for having me. Welcome to have back. You come in. Thank you. Uh, Marlon Hill, you heard Don Horn and Julie Brown. Uh, Don Horn is really an estimable person, I think. I have a lot of respect for him. But frankly, I don't come to the same conclusions really on that closeout memo on Darren Rainey that he and Kathy uh, Rundle came to. How do you look at this? Well, it's all based on the evidence. You know, really, you know, you know Don is the supervisory um, executive at the state attorney's office for um, craft in the grand juries, you know, so he has extensive amount of experience of preparing cases to go right. before. And that's what it's going to, be, going to boil down to at the end of the day at, as it relates to our judicial system. And it's going to be a battle of, um, but, you know, Kathy still has the discretion um, and they make these choices, and you see what's happening in Orlando. So you can live with the choices they made, which is not to charge any of the correctional officers who put Darren Rady in that shower with culpable negligence or any criminal charge. You know, the public is still going to have questions about situations like this. You know, there, there are countless and hundreds of cases similarly where, where cases are not brought. Um, in this situation, they're making a judgment call, and they're going to have to pay the, you know, and they have, you know, to, to Don Horn's point, they, he said he didn't take it to a grand jury so that everything would remain transparent. Anybody can go online and read the closeout memo and, and see what the evidence is, read Julie's stories. But, Mark, it seems like it almost points for people to a larger concept of do prisons need reforming and what goes on inside that we don't know. And to me, that's what I hear when people talk about this. Well, before I address that, how long ago was 1989? 
You know, what you're do, asking journalists to add backwards in their heads. 1989 <laughs> was the last time the Miami-Dade State Attorney's Office brought a, an excessive use of force case against the law enforcement. Exactly, yeah. 1989. The Justice Department has been here and found the Miami Police Department uh, has had rot and has had problems doing its job. We've seen video of, you know, uh, or we've had cases of questionable uses of excessive force. We had the young men on a Memorial Day who got shot to death by a variety of police. And then not only are they are folks never charged, but then it takes years for these investigations to go through. If you listen to Julie Brown's reporting of the Darren Rainey case, they didn't interview all of the witnesses. And then they release it at f late Friday at 5 p.m. Yeah. Usually you do that in government if you yeah. want to bury something because, well, yeah. you know, so what you're kind you, of you are, You've laid this predicate. You are saying what? I am saying is that I can understand why people are very suspicious about this case, even though Mr. Horn laid out a good reason not to prosecute, because they never prosecute, it seems. This guy, and, and then we're going to talk about the system. This guy was in, in prison. Yeah, he had priors. He's a, he was a schizophrenic in prison because he had a cocaine possession charge. It also raises the question. Right? In terms and then, of, now he's dead. It also raises the question in terms of the public's um, suspicion on aggressiveness on pursuing um, law enforcement, right? Even with the case this week, the shootings in, in Brownsville, where we do a lot of work, folks have a sense, you know, are they exhibiting the same sort of passion and urgency to pursue cases against law enforcement? I mean, you know, um, for investigating cases or Plus dedicating resources. We'll get a yeah, uh, good point, and we're going to get Jessica. to it in a second. But, Jessica, you do marketing, and you understand. I think you nodded, as Mark said, look, you release a hugely important closeout memo 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon that is St. Patrick's Day. If that's not trying to bury... Uh, something important. I don't know what it is. I mean, I think this just reeks all around. I think I think the report raises more questions than answers them. I think the public has a right to know what happened, and I think that the report, it, in a lot of people's eyes, is insufficient. Even though you know, uh, Mr. Horn was very professional in being able to lay out his perspective from the prosecution's perspective. Um, mm. I think the public has a right to uh, know what happened in this case, and the the, the government has a a duty to protect inmates in custody. And we should definitely expect more answers on that. You said it raises questions for you. What, what questions in particular? You know, uh, as Mark was saying, this, is a, this inmate had, uh, was known to have uh, psychiatric problems, was in a psychiatric ward. Why was this person not being monitored every 15 minutes? Why wasn't there a certain protocol to make sure that he wouldn't be alone for two hours? That raises yeah. a lot of questions. That's a yeah. lot of time gap. And, you know, a lot of things could have happened that in that two-hour time period and that was did. not accounted yeah. for. Well, they, they did happen. I mean, eventually they found him after nearly two hours lying on his back in a pool of water because he was blocking Seriously. the drain and they say he didn't have burns but an EMT at the scene examined him and said he had first uh, and second degree burns over 30 percent of his body. Well, to answer Glenna's original question where I diverted, we are asking correctionals, correctional officers to be psychiatrists. Yeah. We underfund our mental health system, totally. and, it's, and it seems like our answer to so many things is to build more prisons and a lot yeah. more people up. Uh, this guy, again, he, he was in there for cocaine possession. You know, it, only when white people started to die in big numbers from using too much heroin and fentanyl did drug abuse suddenly become a real health issue. Right. But boy, if you're black and you're charged with cocaine, you're going to prison. And to your point, I think there's a, there's a whole issue here that we really didn't have time to get into with some of the mental health professionals who work in this prison who had come forward to really raise questions about how and still are raising they are. Questions. And still are raising we haven't questions seen questions it in the yeah. budget either yeah. yet. Yeah. Mar Marlon, yeah. let, let's go back to the point you just raised because I think one of the most stunning images that any of us have seen in quite a while was the police vehicle that was shot up the other night uh, in Liberty City, not far from Pork and beans. It was uh, at Brownsville, the Annie, actually. It was Brownsville, in Brownsville the Annie Coleman projects. Yeah, Annie yeah. Coleman <laughs> housing uh, projects. Um, uh, I mean, you just look at this vehicle. Maybe we can get some video up. And you just, you know, you, you think, thank God these two police officers were not killed. You know, that really strikes home for me. You know, in our law firm, we have a partnership with Brownsville Middle School where we are trying to establish a law academy in a courtroom there because there's a, several 
um, external forces around the school, including gangs, including this young kid um, who, yeah. who's been arrested for ambushing, um, allegedly, the police officers. You know, that neighborhood definitely needs um, more more support with regards to what changing is the culture. 18 years old? I mean, 19. 19. 19. 19. It's tragic. Yeah. I mean, you have, you know, young, mostly men, um, who are, you know, very endangered in their life and they're committing bad choices. We need to really support them. Obviously, you know, my, our hearts go out to, you know, the law enforcement that were that were injured. Um, you know, they're doing their jobs. They're trying to protect the community. They're trying to prevent things. And, um, you know, it's a tragic, uh, tragic incident. I, I agree. It should be stated most cops are great and we certainly need them, a huge portion of them. But, boy, when black kids get murdered in the ghetto, Cops never seem to be able to find the shooter. And then all of a sudden they're able to find this guy in a day. Our next topic we will explore in two minutes when we come right back. That's why I did it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We are back with the roundtable, picking up where we left off, Mark. We were talking about the, the arrest in literally fewer than 24 hours of a young man now accused of shooting these two police officers. An incredible arrest lauded by everyone across the board. And then a group of mothers who have lost kids to violence after the lauding of the great police work asked this amazing question, why aren't we getting that kind of attention and that kind of police work investigating the people who killed our kids? And what you'll hear from law enforcement is, oh, no one's cooperating. But I find that difficult to believe when you consider the number of murder cases and also if you consider the case of the young man who shot the police officers. Let's say we don't know if the young man really did it, but certainly whoever shoots a police officer is scum. But the police really have a problem enforcing the law in these poor communities because you had a, a mother of a 15-year-old child who was shot at his cousin's wake. I mean, that's psychopathology. A year ago, that was about a, right. a year ago or so. Yeah. And, and, and that, that killer's still at large. Yeah. Uh, you know, wh why? I think the mothers of the murdered, murdered children really have a fair question to ask, of right? Of course. It's, it's not really a question of one case being more important than the other. Yeah. Just simply asking for equity and parity on how cases are investigated in terms of urgency and resources. Yeah. It's a fair question. Well, you know, you heard them at the at this press conference and, and they were saying they call, they're on it. They call the detectives and they get, uh, well, we're working on it and we don't really have any new leads. And, and to them that's cognitive dissonance because they know, they may know who is at least someone involved or someone who knows something, Jessica. No, I mean, I think I think these mothers have an extremely valid uh, concern, and I think the community deserves answers. We should not have, you know, such a loss of life for young black men in this in this in this community. It should never be happening. Um, and I think that there needs to be a renewed push and a political effort to, you know, get answers. And I think that's very fair. And when we go to Brownsville and we speak to the kids at Brownsville Middle School, we try to encourage them, listen, you need to speak up. If you see something, you need to say something. That's a campaign. We're trying to change that culture yeah. um, with them in terms of their respect for the law and authority and all of that. And it, it's going to take more resources from all aspects and all levels of the community to really transform um, what's happening in And a different style of, com uh, of policing, you know, community policing needs to come back into these neighborhoods. You know, the cops need to be interacting Which I with think they these. Are. Well, under Juan Perez, Miami-Dade Police Correct. Department, and yeah. Chief Giannis in Miami, I think that they are. Also, I think Fort Lauderdale is doing the same thing, and BSO. Well, look how uh, long it took for them to take the gun from Javier Ortiz, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the uh, FOP yeah. union chief, who Weeks. just uh, an abusive troll. This I've guy should not have a gun. <laughs> Well, yeah. Well, I, let's, I'm a little uncomfortable with that. Yeah, we'll, because not, well, he is an abusive case, troll. Well, no, he really is. He, he never a, met a police shooting he didn't like. Let's kind of pivot, if we can, <laughs> to uh, Washington here. And uh, Jessica, this week I think is going to coming weeks going to be a good week for President Trump in one respect, and that is Neil Gorsuch is going to get his up or down vote, and I think he's going to be confirmed by the Senate. And whether you think he's too conservative or not. Neil Gorsuch uh, is, I think, well qualified. Elections have consequences. One consequence is the president gets the name a Supreme Court nominee, and it's Neil Gorsuch. Listen, I mean, I think it's time to to start filling up the positions that are empty in our in our government. We need a justice, 
uh, in we our Supreme nine, Court. We need nine Supreme Court justices. Absolutely. Yeah. We need to fill out our cabinet. So I, I do expect Neil Gorsuch to get confirmed. He has a, a, a great reputation on, uh, on both sides of the political parties. Um, and, you know, he just has a track record of, of doing good work. So we just need to, you know, kind of speed, speed it up, get his... Uh, his folks in there so we can have a functioning, mm. fully functioning government. I question whether he will get 60 votes though. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see what will happen this week. But there is apparently precedent for being confirmed with 51 sure. votes. So, you know, right, we'll they'll, see. They'll probably, if there's going to be a filibuster, they'll probably just go nuclear as the, uh, what they say, the nuclear yeah. option is and blow up yeah. the filibuster with Supreme Court picks. M Mark, Good. this, this, <laughs> this, this uh, late this week uh, when the president tweeted that Mike Flynn should get immunity and go testify and as far as Russian meddling in the election, it's a witch hunt. I mean, frankly, I, the president can't get out of his own way sometimes. Why would he do that? You know, it's amazing. I, I think the president uses Twitter the way a lot of us do. Something comes in his mind, he tweets it. And then he might be two steps behind everything he tweets. Right. Why he continues to throw gasoline on a fire that's consuming his administration, at least on a theoretical level, obviously, is puzzling. Yeah, because I think he questions the, you know, he's he's does not like the fact that his presidency is being questioned in terms of legitimacy. It gets under his skin. He doesn't like it at all. So well, he tweets I, it. I angry, think also, you know, he wants to know why was, you know, in, in the middle of talking about Russia hacking the election, why was there incidental incidental uh, surveillance of of not of per, perhaps himself and definitely his associates. And, you know, the only thing that we've been able to prove well, that's been criminal is the unmasking and the unveiling of some of these names. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think most reasonable people would say, all right, let the House and Senate, mainly Senate Intelligence Committee, do its work, let the FBI conduct its investigation. But the more the president questions the validity of even doing the investigation, yeah. the worse he looks. Absolutely. And, you know, he's, he's prolonging something that's over. The election is over, right? Well, and he, and like he's Mike, the president, he's, right. And we're not. Yeah. All right, so thank you. We are out of time. <laughs> thank you all. Still to come, my personal perspective about this very strange and disturbing week in Washington. Before we leave you this morning, a personal perspective about the president and the truth. They're barely on speaking terms. In his book, The Art of the Deal, Mr. Trump said he practiced truthful hyperbole, which for him means you take a grain of truth and exaggerate it beyond recognition. And lately, it's been more hyperbole, less truth. For example, here's the tweet Mr. Trump sent out on Friday morning urging Michael Flynn to seek immunity from prosecution before he testifies about his connections to Russia. And the president calls all the Russia election meddling story a witch hunt. The president, I think, is willfully ignoring the fact that 18 U.S. intelligence agencies all agreed that Russia, at the direction of Vladimir Putin, went to great lengths to interfere in the presidential election last year. The Russians were trying to corrupt the very cornerstone of our democratic process, free elections. And yet President Trump refuses to acknowledge Russia's actions because he's afraid that doing so would taint his election victory. Hey, Mr. President, get real. You are the President of the United States. Nothing is going to change that. And of all people, you should be most concerned about a foreign power, any power, but especially an adversary like Russia trying to influence a presidential election, even if they were trying to help you. Let's find out how many of your aides knew about it and even perhaps took part. And as for giving legal advice to your former national security advisor, not a good move. Let Mike Flynn work out the terms under which he testifies with congressional committees and the FBI. Flynn has already given the FBI one version of what he did. He's probably asking for immunity because he wants to tell Congress another version. The House Intelligence Committee just can't get its act together, but the Senate Intelligence Committee is acting honorably and in a bipartisan fashion. Good for them. We need to know what the Russians did or did not do before the election. This is not a witch hunt. This is about protecting our precious right to vote and choosing our president fairly and freely. That's my perspective for this week. Hope you have a great Sunday. Remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. And get in touch. We invite <laughs> you to weigh in on any topic that you like in the news. Here are all the ways you can reach us.
Email, Facebook, Twitter, any of these addresses were easy to find. We love to hear from you. Have a beautiful Sunday.